Welcome to Funnel Reboot, the podcast that shares ideas on how to upgrade your lead generation. Here is your host, Glenn Schmeltzley. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot. Today, we're diving into marketing through influencers. Before we do that, I want to remind you that I'd love to hear what you think about this show. And I would I really appreciate you passing on mention of us or coming back to me with a comment on what you want to hear reach out on any social channel or via our website to today's show. It's a fact that consumers and corporate buyers no longer trust our brands. Well, we can maybe earn their trust, but they don't initially place it in us. We're not alone though. They don't trust government either. They don't trust the media. They don't trust advertising, but buyers do still trust people like them. How do you reach outside of the formal channels to get to those buyers? You can use influencers. Our guest today is a UK-based advisor on the business of working with influencers. Previously, he worked in the promotional product industry, running major conferences, as well as membership associations. He launched the first association dedicated to influencers called the Branded Content Marketing Association. Additionally, he runs a podcast called Influence. And in 2021, he published the book Influencer Marketing Strategy. Let's go hear this talk with Gordon Glenister. Very glad to welcome Gordon Glenister. Welcome to the show, Gordon. Welcome, Glenn. Lovely to see you. Yes, likewise. And I'm really glad to have you on and talking about a book. We have never featured a book like this before. Would you please tell me what the title is? It's called Influencer Marketing, How to Create Successful Influencer Marketing Strategy. Yes. And it's just like the title is a mouthful. The book is a mouthful. It's a pretty (laughs) hefty book. Well, yes. And it took a hell of a long time to write it. 88,000 words, 300 pages. Oh my goodness. 70 people I've interviewed. Not that I'm counting. (laughs) Right, right. By the numbers. And it's interesting because this is a field which, you know, here you published it. It was in 2021? Yes, yes. Okay. And yet, influencer marketing... Uh, it didn't come around in 2021. Um, it's been with us for a while, right? This is yeah. a field 20, that is 20, rather mature. Twenty. Well, um, I think what we found in 2016, the industry was reportedly worth about 1.6 billion. Hmm. Uh, now we're approaching 15 billion, um, and that probably is still understated. Um, what, what's, what's been quite seismic is the rise over the last few years and particularly in the pandemic in the last two years when people, you know, so many more people came online for their own businesses, uh, consumers were fake that were on furlough, or, you know, not working, were suddenly consuming way more content. And of course, the creators, these people that were creating content. Uh, content we're, we're finding that they've got a floods of new followers and new engagement but also we saw new people particularly on platforms like tiktok um you know average guys and girls suddenly realizing my goodness a piece of a, a video a humorous video has suddenly got in you know a million views or something has gone viral and then they suddenly realize they've become a, you know accidental opportunities for businesses to engage with these people so yeah it's been really fascinating over the uh, the last few years for sure to be sure. And that low barrier to entry of someone almost stumbling into it uh, does seem to be uh, the norm in this industry. Now, before we get too far along, let's actually just trot out a definition so that you know we can take those things that you just talked about and maybe bundle them into a sentence. What, in your words, Gordon, would you say is an influencer? Well, it's an individual who is able to um, promote a product or service, often through thought leadership, um, opinion, uh, or content creation. And it's it's no more more challenging than that, uh, to be honest. And it's not even new. I mean, when we talk about influencer marketing, um, it's a bit like Emperor's New Clothes. Uh, We've known the power of word of mouth marketing, haven't we? And And the fact that we... 
we relate better to the opinions of, of others, friends and family. Um, and of course, now marketers are realising that traditional advertising are just not cutting through in the same way that it once did, particularly amongst those younger generations who've got their own almost hatred of traditional advertising and, co and, and, and corporate branding. But they'll go and find out new products and services from their favourite content creator, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I saw in there a place that uh, you were mentioning it does tend to cut through and that... I think there's also a bit of psychology here. You quote someone named Hester Bates to say that, you know, people will glom onto others who seem to fit what they, you know, want. Um, she said, we all follow someone we aspire to be like. Yeah, that she does. And, and that's a good example. Um, and, and that's why they've become so popular. I mean, just to give you some stats, there's about 85, 80, 85 percent of inf social media influencers, not so much B2B influencers, are women. Average age is around 28. So what we've seen is a lot of, you know, very inspirational entrepreneurs coming out of this, particularly, as I say, females. And of course, what that does is the amount of people that say to me, oh, I want to be, want to be an influencer, or my, my, if I speak to the parents, they say, oh, my children just want to become influencers. Because of that point that you've just raised, they want to aspire to them. They want to, um, they're re I mean, some of these particularly younger people are so good on video. Um, you know, you look at us sort of mid-50 males and suddenly the little red light comes on sometimes and it's like, <laughs> and yet, you know, one of the words I will really cement home when it comes to influencer marketing is that is authenticity. People yeah. love to connect with people that they can relate to within their niche. So if you are, you know, if you're somebody that's interested in beauty, then to be able to uh, watch a YouTube tutorial with somebody that you think is really great is helping you do that makeup or do that, you use that help their skincare. Then, and, and don't you think it's amazing that somebody can keep the attention of somebody for what could be a 40 minute or an hour long tutorial? Yes. And that is why brands are loving influence of influencers, because, you know, to be able to hold the attention of their audience and to have a really engaged audience, um, why would they not want to connect with them? You think about a traditional TV advert where you've got a few seconds worth of attention, yet a content creator could have an hour. Yeah, they, they definitely have the ability. And as you say, at a connection level, they're digital natives, so their ability to, yes, look at the little red light on a cam and connect with a person at the other end. Uh, they, of course, are doing loops around folks who are, you know, who, who have done that in an offline sense and are just learning how to do it online. They are. They are. When it comes to how they are able to, you know, per, perhaps provide reach, let's maybe take a moment and swivel over to the social networks for a moment so that we can understand why they seem to have uh, a better go of it than let's say us just running ads and i will remind you i run an advertising agency the the difference though is in the social networks unlike let's say google ads and paid search um, instead of activating content what we're really aiming to do is get initial awareness and engagement right yeah. And why is it that the uh, influencers can get that early awareness and engagement in ways that a brand will have difficulty with by paying for, or sorry, by organically trying to get their message out straight to their audience? Because fundamentally, people advertising is, is way more persuasive than just um, traditional posts and, and, and adverts. We, we, you know, if you, if, and you look at how much video content is now being shared online, it's, it's growing. I mean, there's going to be a time where it's, it's, it's at 90% almost. Um, I always say to people, look at the behavior of yourself. When you're on Facebook or you're scrolling on your phone, what is it that jumps out at you? Is it entertaining? Is it inspirational or is it educational? Those are the three things I always talk about when creating content. So if it's any one of those three things, you're more likely to share it, to comment on it. Yeah, oh, isn't that lovely? Isn't that cute? 
So I would say to all of your listeners, think about the behavior of what you are doing, because if, if you're thinking about the behavior of what you like uh, and are doing, that is the type of content that you too could be creating for your own brand. You know, how can you make it entertaining? How can you make it educational rather than the constant abject promotion? Because all that is, quite frankly, is noise. And content creators are really, really good. I mean, I, I interviewed five recently for London Fashion Week. And there's some really fascinating insights that came out of that podcast. They actually saw themselves as almost like personal shoppers for their audience. Hmm. They'd go out and find the best that's out there and curate it and bring it back to their audience in, in, in all bite-sized, interesting chunks. You know, let's be honest, um, Glenn, if we go to the shops or the mall and we go and buy some clothes, we've all it is is largely flat lay or stuff on a hanger. Maybe there's the odd mannequin. Yeah. Whereas if you're following an influencer, you're getting a real, you're getting talking for guys. This, this is what I've been um, wearing recently. It looks really good. If you try this using some really good video techniques, then you've got images and video of them out and about at events. And you think, oh, I, I love all that. And that's the reason why this sort of click to shop that Instagram has done very well and, and TikTok now. So you like the style. And with the little links, you can go straight to buy them. And that's why, you know, influencers, in my opinion, are almost becoming the new retailers. Right. So here's that. That's the end run that's happening. And I see it as being largely in response to what the social networks have done by squeezing down the amount of uh, reach that an organic post will give. Uh, they are basically saying to that brand, look, you can pay to play. Um, or, you know, you can find, uh, an audience and the, the brand will look at it and say, well, maybe we on our own can't, but there is a person out there who does a lot of content. And if we think of approaching them to do branded content for their existing audience, now we're getting somewhere. Yeah. Which, which actually I think is, is, is interesting. Um, influencers will only take on brand deals that are are in line with their own audience values. Because if they do that, if they get that wrong, then the, their audience are going to say, well, you know, what, what's all this about? You know, we, we're following you for your, for your beauty, your fitness, or your, you, you know, your cookery tips. We, you know, if you, if you chuck in a brand deal or a partnership that isn't in Congress to that, number one. The second thing is the tone of voice of the influencer uh, has to be consistent. So when a brand says, this is what we want you to do, blah, 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 all of these things, and the influencer could say, well, I wouldn't really say it like that. I wouldn't. That's not what I would normally do. Hmm. Um, and so the, the, re the reason why the industry jargon of collaboration or collabs is designed to be just that, a collaboration. And I often say to brands, try if you've got, if you want to reach out to influencers, don't just use them as amplifiers. Think about bringing them into the conversation or the opportunity way earlier. They are in their, in their own right, mini creative agencies, so use them. Hmm. You know, they may have some amazing ideas as to how your brand could be promoted in a way that you hadn't even thought about. Yes, this is true. Uh, they, <laughs> and, and you remind us in the book that, of course, their focus is at an end that let's be honest, most brands aren't as obsessed about, which is the audience. Correct. So from that standpoint, um, it is important to understand that they consider that to be the cornerstone of what they are doing and that they will uh, not betray that trust. Um, however, they do, if they have started to grow in a sizable audience and want to earn income, they will look at things like affiliate sales. They will look at referrals. They will look at, as you say, having a direct click uh, for a sale on their site. Uh, and, and we're going to get into this shortly, but, you know, we have many, many models and many, many rules that we must consider if we are trying to then step them up into either um, a, a contract where we give them just a flat rate or some other kind of arrangement where they have skin in the game and are incentivized to actually 
uh, sell for us. So let's let's maybe talk about this. And I think it's important. You said the word mini agency. It is worth stressing. Again, there are so many of them that have come out of the woodwork that influencers should not be approached the same way that we would, for example, go to an agency for celebrity endorsement, right? Yeah. Can you just maybe outline for me and set expectations because they are not as you know far along on that you know, having yeah. all the dot I's dotted and the T's crossed as we would have if we just wanted to go get somebody for a celebrity spot. Yeah. So, uh, well, first of all, when it comes to celebrity in most instances and big influencers, they will be managed by right. a talent agency and, and all of those brand deals will be contracted. And um, so it's really important that that is in place because one of the reasons why any influencer campaign goes wrong is because brand had a different perspective or uh, an expectation of the outcome that was different from the influencer. And if yep. you think about it, you're asking somebody to recreate a piece of content. Uh, where is it? Uh, how long is the campaign? You know, there's a whole number of deliverables. And it's very, very important that there is uh, a contract in place, uh, particularly where payment is concerned. Um, and one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that um, influencers should absolutely di disclose that they have had any form of payment or any form of coercion or editorial control. And that, that could also be, by the way, gifted. But gifted if, if they, the company has said, we'll only give you this if you will post. Right, because that's a form of coercion, and that should, and there's nothing wrong with the influencer doing and taking any of those things as long as they let their audience know that. And the simple way to do that is by using the word hashtag ad, which is almost the global universal expression. It could be hashtag advert or or on Instagram, I've got the paid partnership package now. Many, many more consumers are used to seeing these words, but um, I think. Where that doesn't happen and think and, and, and influencers think, oh, well, it's not really that important. Let me tell you, it's going to be uh, very, very important in the coming years because the regulators are coming down. They're starting with with the bigger influencers and celebrities, but that is they're going to start to use um, technology uh, to weed out people that are not disclosing these these proper guidelines because you're right in a proper advertising agency they would go through uh, all sorts of standards and regulatory requirements so why shouldn't an influencer uh, in the same way um and also another big issue for me is making sure that you are completely aware with the credibility of that influencer's audience um and and the fact that it hasn't been they haven't bought followers or they haven't engaged in any other inauthentic mean. In fact, to be honest, I almost call that somewhat like fraud because yeah. if you are amplifying your audience size for the benefit of monetary gain with a, with a brand, then um, you are hiding to nothing, nothing. And, and quite frankly, it will affect your engagement rate as well because if you've got a load of followers that really are, are not connected with your key values and mission you know you're you're on nothing i mean I, I i'm i work with a with a global influencer marketing agency and um you know we have a minimum requirement a minimum standard of, of 80 percent audience credibility score uh, and even some of well-known influencers have dropped beneath that um so you know they will be losing out on campaigns because more and more of the industry is looking and brands need to be safe. They need to make sure that there, that there isn't anything that's dubious there because unfortunately when you're dealing with people, you can get, you know, caught. <laughs> yes. Yes. And there's a lot out there that I wasn't aware of until I read the book that helped me understand that when a brand embarks on this search, they're not starting from scratch. Um, yes, as you get smaller, smaller scale, um, you're going to have influencers that may not uh, be as savvy with, you know, abiding by those FTC regulations, Correct. using the hashtags. However, um, I was really stunned 
to hear about all the information that is. It's almost like they are like athletes, like, you know, baseball players with, you know, box score stats. Um, can you take us through a little bit of like oh, well, how so these they, are rated and how we can actually find and once we found start to gauge where these yeah. influencers are as far as how appealing they would be for our brand? So very good point. There are a number of influencer agencies and influencer platforms that exist. I happen to work for one, which is called Audience to Media. We have 105 million people and profiles on our database now. It's one of the biggest in the world. And what we do is we provide reports for um, those influencers that are selected for a campaign. And on those reports, we'll be in a position to be able to find out um, their mix, the, this is the creator's audience, the mix of their uh, gender split. So how many of them, how many of the influencers followers are men, how many of them are women, um, what their age range is. So between 18 and 35, or it, it literally come out with different, um, like a graph. This is very, very important from a brand's point of view, because you can imagine if a brand's got a target audience that's largely driven by a female. Um, what you don't want then is to connect with a content creator, influencer, that, that, that on the face of it might look good because they've got you know 600,000 followers. But actually, unless you know what's behind those followers, you could have, find that 90% of that female, because of the content that she puts out, 90% of that audience is men. And you've got a female orientated brand yes complete waste of, of of money because only you're only going to be talking to 10 percent. the other thing is important is geolocation so where is the split of the audience and we can find that out right across the world so we can find out 10 percent of their audience is from the united kingdom 80 percent mm. from the states um another 10 percent from india so again, that's very important. Yeah, um, you, you've raised, and, and there was another one that uh, kind of is s subtly there underneath the numbers, which is sentiment. I hadn't thought sentiment. of it until you pointed out, you know, for example, if I have a, um, let's say it's in a technology space and I have someone who uh, I believe could be good for a brand, it, you'd need to peel beneath just the audience numbers to understand, for example, maybe they go on and rant about the kinds of uh, technology glitches that they have. And right. that's why their audience follows them, not to, you know, provide buying tips. So until you look deeper at it, you know, you could be going in completely the wrong direction. You, you could absolutely. One thing to consider is if you want to work with an influencer, a decent one that's a professional influence will have a media deck, a media pack, and that's typically like a resume that we would otherwise have. And that will typically have quite a lot of information, the types of brand partnerships they've done before, their audience, maybe some, some example posts that they've done before. So it's a really great way for you to understand a little bit more uh, about what they do. Um, it's very important that you look at the engagement rate. For example, on Instagram, on average, it's 1.6, 1.7%. Mm -hmm. So uh, typically... Uh, a micro and a nano influencer, nano being one to 10,000 followers um, and a micro 10 to, to 100,000, they tend to be um, have a, a higher level of engagement. And the reason for that is because they're able to, if you think about it, you've got lower numbers, you're more likely to be able to respond as an influencer to your audience. Whereas if you've got 3 million followers on Instagram and you get 20,000 likes and and 4,000 comments, well, it's physically impossible to be able to go back to all of those. And to be fair, some of the very big influencers have social media teams to enable them to, to, to happen. So you you sometimes think, oh, is it really Kylie Jenner that's responding right, to that, uh, right. uh, uh, that comment? Probably not. Whereas actually, if it's your regular Joe that's got 15,000 followers, the chances are, uh, that, that you have and that's why brands sometimes use a multitude on a campaign that isn't just one it's a mix yes. so you've got reach and engagement yeah good point and i think you termed folks that are above that micro size you know we started to get a macro uh influencers. Macro, yeah yeah uh, sure. fr from that standpoint i i think it's funny that they actually begin to 
um, move into a zone where their own uh, authenticity becomes stressed. As Correct. you say, you know, does someone looking at a person knowing there are three million, they're one of three million people reaching out to them. If they say something and they get a you know response back, uh, maybe it doesn't quite have the same voice of that person. So we start to you know strain the credibility, and that actually makes the case stronger for the micro and for the nano size influencers. It, it, it does, it does, and and the other the, the other big thing as well is. Influencer marketing, if you're going to do it for the first time, don't expect it to be a silver bullet. Right. Right. It, you know, in the same way, you don't watch the TV ad and say, oh, yeah, great. Let's run out and go and buy this product. You yeah? know, it can be great. It can be. We talk about 11 times greater ROI than any other form of media. I will caveat that by saying when done well. That's having proper objectives right. and goals at the start of a campaign and making sure that you you optimize and measure the, the content afterwards. What's really great, though, about influencer marketing, unlike a billboard ad or a TV, once those ads have gone, they're gone. Whereas, actually, if you think about it, you can, you can work with some influencers at part one, optimize it, change it, and then part two of the campaign you could you could take it in a slightly different direction because you realize is that of the 20 influencers that you're working with 10 of them are doing really well with content a um whereas content b is is not resonating so well so you actually say to the others right True. okay we're gonna we're gonna try a different approach because this is what's sticking True. Um, it's also very good for a b testing if you want to try um using influencers as part of a product research or um, we, we've seen plenty of examples, even Nike and, and other brands where they've, they've put ideas in front of influencers to share with their audiences, you know, which of these styles do you like? If you were to personalize your own footwear, what would they look like? Um, there's, there's also an example of an agency that I interviewed um, and they were, it's a product was called Puricane, which is a sugar sweetener. And they okay. were going to launch it in South America. Um, and what they did is they flew a number of influencers over into this retreat, hotel retreat, for three or four days. And they, they literally recreated uh, this new brand with the influencers and their audiences over wow. these three days. So what, what was happening is the strategy was being created in this workshop, but the influencers were reaching out to their audiences and saying, look, what are your what are your top issues and challenges when it comes to sugar sweeteners and what what do you like in these styles red blue or purple or whatever so can you imagine when the product was actually launched you you've got this sense of the not only the influencers bought into it but also their audiences so you know you can imagine yes. the level of engagement and, and the institutional knowledge they have of their markets which is like kind of getting market research for free well, it absolutely. You compare the, the television doesn't doesn't re, you know you can't you're advertising on TV. You can't reach back to the audience and no. say you know what do you think of this ad? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it it's it's on a completely different level. And just before we move into actually engaging and doing campaigns with influencers, let's maybe hit straight on. Uh, one of the issues that I know brands are going to be reticent about, and that is the association with an influencer who is going to be able to speak their mind either now or in the future. And what they say may be counter to some brand values, um, or as we've seen some famous cases of, they do something that causes them to uh, go in a completely different direction than the brand wants to go and they get dropped like a hot potato. What, what advice do you have for brands who get paralyzed by that? Well, first of all, caveat mTOR, which is let the buyer beware. <laughs> okay. You're dealing with, if you're dealing with famous people, the reason they are famous is because of who and what they are. So be very clear about what that is. Uh, the second thing is, um, is having a contract in place um and making sure that it's absolutely very clear about okay. what so there, what there, is, there might be damage clauses or things like that if this happens then you know and, yeah. and to seek to seek legal advice there are specialist lawyers uh, in the influence as well you, you are going to invest a lot of money you need to make sure that you have done your homework you have looked back 
at their Instagram or their Twitter or whatever their feeds. But, you know, at at the end of the day, I I would also say to some brands, you know, keep your brand real. Don't get stuck up by the corporate world of, you know, if you, you know, the reason why younger people are engaging with influence is because they love the freedom. They love the authenticity, you know, Um, do you know what I mean? And it's, it's finding that narrative that, that these these guys and girls uh, really can take brands to another level, uh, and I think it's it's the nerve and nervousness of of old school corporate perhaps that is yeah. just feeling uncomfortable because this is a new way of of marketing. But look, guess what, guys? People are not reacting to cold calling in the same way. They're not reacting to to selling on on email in the same way, you know. The, the world order of the way we consume information and we buy products online. I mean, live streaming is huge now. I mean, Amazon and um, uh, Alibaba recently um, put out a request to recruit 100,000 influencers. Well, why were they doing that? Well, yes. because actually the evidence in Asia is that these these influencers are killing it. I mean, there's yeah. an example of a, like, a lady called Becky Lai, which I mentioned in the book. Yep. And famously sold a hundred minis cars in 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 five minutes. I mean, it's insane. It's insane, isn't it? Big ticket. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we, yeah, we're not just talking about lipstick here. Um, the Correct. the the platforms themselves are uh, clearly interested in cultivating these. Um, although it's not even in your top six or seven. Uh, as far as platforms go, I heard recently that LinkedIn has now doubled down on their creative accelerator program. They have. Uh, yeah. And so they started in the US and now they've opened it to India and they will be going through other countries. And like you say with Instagram, they're just asking people to declare themselves. It's so smart um, because you can imagine that they're probably going to then be looking as the middleman to go to the brands and say, well, we have someone who can help you. It's a, it's a wonderful co-opting strategy, but getting back to getting back to what you were saying about how you cannot hide behind this corporate facade. If we think about situations where an influencer has uh, shared something that is, let's say a shortcoming of a product in a review that they've done, the best situations I've seen are where the CEO or someone who has um, credibility from the brand engages openly in dialogue about that. We heard that we're making changes and, and they're transparent about it and they they actually end up even better than before. hundred percent. I mean, you've used the, you know, the key word there, transparency. We know we, we want people to not hide behind stuff we we want people to be open if you've made a mistake say sorry you know there have been many examples of uh of, of things that go wrong and we we relate better you know we're sorry about this we've listened to you absolutely i agree with you entirely how powerful is that and, and again the values that it brings across if the homework has been done between the brand and the influencer to make sure those values are in sync then the audience is going to uh, they're they're going to feel that, and I would even go further than you to say that the next times that they continue to see that influencer, don't tell me that somewhere deep in their psyche, they're not remembering, oh, yes, this is uh, who was allied with that person. I'm going to remember that brand. And yeah. that that may even you know exceed the kind of depth that you can get with even the best advertising. Yeah, I want to just share with you something else, which was came from my one of my podcasts, which is about diversity. Um, there was a there was a lady uh, called Louisa Hatt, and she's a fashion content creator um, uh, of ethnic background. And what she was doing is she was promoting a quintessential English brand, and that that many of her audience wouldn't have honestly would have wouldn't have related to. Right. But because she created some amazing content, um, the feedback that she got from her audience was absolutely phenomenal. And some of the, I can almost quote the words she said, you know, uh, um, I must admit I wouldn't have associated myself with that brand, but because of the way that you, you, pr- you brought it to our attention, you promoted it, 
I feel totally at sync with it. I want to go out and buy products and services from them. Wow. And she was able to share that back with the brand in, in a way. And, and now she works with them like all the time. And this is the other thing about working with content creators. Don't ever think about them as just a one-off campaign. If you can try and create brand ambassador programs where they are almost like your ultimate salesperson, your, your sales and marketing advocate, um, it can be really, really powerful because your audience then associate you with um, a Gymshark ambassador. You may well see it in many of the uh, bios and things. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really, really powerful for the brand, actually. Um, Let's talk about ambassadors for a minute, because that was okay. a, kind of a new concept for me, at least. So it, it does uh, have that long term feel to it, right? By encouraging Absolutely. loyalty. Maybe, maybe take a second and just give us the, the lowdown on ambassador programs. So ambassadors could actually be not just influencers; they could be they could be consumer uh, fans, advocates. Yeah. So there are many examples of, of programs that uh, you may well start to see on in websites, join our ambassador program. And those could well be linked to affiliates. They could be uh, gifting campaigns. They could, they could provide individuals with exclusive content to events. Um, they could be providing them with great news stories, tutorials, webinars, all sorts of things. Early, um, uh, you also said early availability to product, right? There's yeah, early availability products are really good. Yeah, that's right. You, you're absolutely right. So the, these are the sorts of things, you know, if you make somebody an ambassador, you are A, recognizing them. It's a fabulous term. People feel, if, 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 if you say that I'm an ambassador to something, it does make you feel connected to that brand. Um, now, that said, to be successful, uh, to have a successful ambassador program, you need, if I'm honest, to have a community manager or you need somebody to manage the ambassadors, making yeah. sure that you're making them easy for them to share the content. It's no point in saying, oh, well, sign up to our ambassador program and leave them to it. You need to have a cohesive, you know, ambassador marketing plan that's in sync with your overall strategy um, and, and make them for special, you know, perhaps even have a sales ladder and do competitions and challenges Keep, keep the energy, keep the excitement going as though they were your own sales force. Yeah. That's the way to, that's the way to look at it. Um, and, um, you know, be, be inspiring. And, and, and some are going to be more successful than others. They, ambassadors for, for consumers tend not to be paid um, right. because of the, but actually the level of engagement of somebody that has just a thousand followers is could be up to 25 30 percent well if that then and 10 percent of that is going on to convert on on websites then you're getting real sales value on your product for what this is going to cost you very much true uh, there's uh again some of this like you said it's not being uh, necessarily paid out but if you use you mentioned in the book utm uh, parameters and Correct. tracking and coupon codes so right. there is a way uh, to fan out among this much broader group uh, and see what kind of return you're getting for it. Um, yeah, and, and also aspirational. Remember, you started this by talking about aspirational. So if you've got, a, within the ambassador program, you've got a few influencers, then you've almost got, you can almost create a gold, a gold, silver level of aspiration based upon the amount of sales the ambassadors are generating. Yes, it, there's uh, many reasons to do it. And let's even just back it down to if you thought of it as nothing more than a group of your best customers, um, if you're not already as a brand doing something to thank your best customers, frankly, you've got bigger problems. Yes, indeed you have, yeah. <laughs> uh, when it comes to looking for these an area I wasn't even aware of was all the tools and platforms that are available for finding out about um, influencers. You, you, you brought out some stats saying 1,200 was the last count of how many there it's are? Even, it's, even, it's even more than that, you know, and it's probably too many, if I'm honest now. Um, so there's, there's different types. There's one which what we call a self-serve, which effectively are you running, you're paying like a license fee each month yes. to access a, uh, a database um, 
uh, effectively discovery. That's finding influencers. There are others that will actually manage the entire process online um, from briefing, finding influencers, briefing them, contracting them, and, and running an ex and then getting the analytics tool as well. You know, that's that's more expensive. Yes. And then, of course, there's influencer agencies that will take all that pain away from you and um, they'll they'll run the whole campaign for you um, typically you're looking at probably about a 20 percent management fee but it does vary yes um, up to 70 um, percent you said in some cases it can be it depends yeah. on depends on the complexity of you know what i was going to say to you guys is that influencer outreach is not for the faint-hearted. If you think that you're just going to go and um, reach, go on Instagram or whatever, and go and reach a lot of influencers uh, that you think are relevant to your brand, there's a lot of work involved. Yeah, um, and even if you find the right people, um, how do you know they're going to accept or want to work with you? Even though you, and then you say, "Oh well, I just want you to, to send you some stuff and hope that you'll promote it." Sixty-five plus percent influencers ignore email and direct outreach and the reason they do that is because they get a lot of crap in their inbox that is that is not congruous congruent with their values right it's not relevant to what they want now in some instances you'd like to think that they would acknowledge that but a lot of these really good people they're just very busy and they're working on their own so i always say to people treat them as human beings you know they're not they're not just a yes they are a brand but give them some respect don't just assume that they're going to you're going to send them a product and they're going to promote it. You know, they, they some of the people I speak to have, have inundated with stuff and they can't they can't cope with it. They're trying to multitask. And these, you know, these guys and girls are often they're photographers, videographers, they're audience builders, they're website yeah, writers, writers, they're blog yeah. writers, yes. they're, they're, they're location scouts. And you your, absolutely takes time. Um, I mean, I have, and it's not a question of just taking a picture and then just bunging up on Instagram. Not at all. The really good ones have really thought about the hashtags. They've thought about the time of day they're going to post it. They've talked about the background. They've talked about the, they've thought about the lighting. You know, um, success doesn't happen overnight. It really doesn't. It's about literally drilling down, being consistent with what you are doing and the message and understanding the analytics, right? So this is really, really important for content creators and for brands. Knowing what type of content works really, really well. I'm just gonna give you guys a bit of a tip, um, which you might like to consider. Go, if it's on LinkedIn, just to say on LinkedIn, go and have a look at the last 10 posts of 10 of your competitors. The last 10 posts of 10 of your competitors and look at the level of engagement on each of those posts and make a comment next to them. What type of content was it and how did your, the audience react to it? If you can imagine putting that on an Excel spreadsheet, you're going to get a whole load of insights. If you get the very best of those insights, put those into your content calendar, your content plan, then you'll know that largely within my niche, People are liking this type of video. They are liking this type of content. And then you can go off into the sunset and watch it all happen. <laughs> um, yes, I hope people caught that. That was actually gold. Uh, <laughs> and if I, if I may bring another part of the book out that um, would allow someone, let's say they haven't even dipped their toe in with influencers yet, you could take everything you just said on something like LinkedIn take your own content that is now informed by those best practices and don't even worry yet about going to an outside influencer ask your own employees to post absolutely absolutely yeah yeah we you know i tell you what i love is when i see some uh, uh, something on linkedin or, or facebook it says we're hiring really excited about the growth of the company and it comes from a junior employee not from the ceo or not from the hr team yeah you know if an ibm actually i've done a really good podcast a little while ago by like a guy called ryan uh, bars who is the head of Ad advocacy at ibm and um you do, do do check it out if if you have a moment the reason he talks all about employee advocacy and uh, um you know ibm is a big corporate it giant of course. as many you know with thousands and thousands of employees now um 
the salespeople generally they're there to sell you know so customers are, are under no illusions as to what their job is but but some of the people that provide technical expertise are seen as highly valuable within their customer organization probably because they're not there to sell so a lot of those people became uh, join this program as as what they've called IBMers. They're not called them influencers. They call right. them IBMers. They've got their own brand identity uh, internally. And what the marketing advocacy team were doing was sharing leading reports. You know, lots of guides, lots of really interesting thoughts and ideas. And so, what were happening was the client relationship with the experts was seen as very, very um, supportive and helpful. And of course, then when the salespeople are involved and in, 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 in coming into the conversation, it, it's in a position of authority, not one that's the t- traditional buyer-seller relationship. So your employees are hugely valuable as potential uh, influencers. Not everybody wants to be, and it's important that you, you don't True. make anything mandatory, but if people would like to share uh, company content, then perhaps create a competition, create a challenge. Um, do something exciting and uh, you know so we can jointly grow our LinkedIn or grow our Facebook account and thank you to all of our amazing team that's done that you can imagine how impactful that would be and it's impactful even if you think about that second of time where a person is evaluating if they're going to receive a message or not um, we all have uh, a, a membrane there that is resistant when we see a logo, but is accepting when we see a face. So, yeah, absolutely. right. And, and so you have even, and I'm not saying that they will uh, always have amazing stats for uh, actually getting that conversion. But if you think about even just getting the chance to get that conversion, you're going to do far better uh, using people of any sort, outside influencer or employee. I want to run into, while we've got a little bit of time left, talking about how we're going to track. And uh, this is something where, you know, now we're talking real money. Uh, You say, you quote a launch metric study that says, you know, the average thing that we're expecting to spend uh, in a initial campaign, uh, the cohort I saw that was kind of the middle of the curve was 5K to 20K in spend. So if we're going to put that money out, we want to see what's coming back. I'd like your response on one of the things that you raise. There are no shortage of stats, but I think one of the things that our audience has to brace for is that depending on which social network you choose, the stats are going to be completely different. They are. And and this is not standardized at all. No, no, it really isn't. It does differ entirely. I mean, LinkedIn and Twitter, much more focused around B2B, um, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and um, and yeah. TikTok. And, and they more. don't even have the same KPIs. No, they right? don't. They don't. I mean, I, I think any campaign, you should think about what, what are you trying to do with your overall marketing budget? Don't just look at influencer marketing as a silo and say, right, okay, this is this is I'm I'm putting I'm betting on black <laughs> yeah I'm betting on red think think about it as part of your overall uh, strategy you know it can be phenomenally successful influencer marketing but it it can also fall over as well so I would say that um, when you if you run a, a test campaign I mean a lot of this of course depends on the type of influencers you're using the quality of the content because you could have an amazing content creator but actually if the if the content doesn't doesn't flow well because it's been a brand asset rather than one that's been used by the the influencer per se then but remember an influencer doesn't want a bad campaign it's bad for them yes you know so they all want they would want to put their 10 penny in and say look we we would recommend this 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 and this I mean, typical metrics would, would be, you know, the, the, the engagement, which will be shares, likes, comments, what what actions are people taking um, as a result of seeing that content. Um, but also make it easy for the consumer to take an action, put a, put a link in there, 
right. ask them to do something. You know, if you are measuring something and you haven't put a call to action in your in your um, content, then well, <laughs> it's not necessarily going to going to work. Um, challenges and competitions can work really, really well because you've got a def you've got a deadline. Anything that requires people to do something like like straight away, yes, or cliffhanger content where you are bringing them into maybe a series. A lot of um, you, you look look at the way we consume content on Netflix, for example. Right. It's, it really does flow really well. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, there yeah. also needs to be a time allowed for this. Uh, we have to. The data is going to come in, but it's not going to come in immediately. And we need to allow for people to take away what the influencer has said, ponder it, maybe their own buying cycle, uh, or at least their time to take the next step on their buyer journey, take some consideration. So uh, do you have any counsel on how long we need to let run, an influencer run, run do campaign. something before we have a verdict on it? Oh, so how long to, to, to run a campaign, did you mean? Yeah. Well, um, I often talk about um, a month to six weeks, um, but they can be shorter. Mm -hmm. um, what, one thing that's really great about um, video and blogs and stuff is so often creators will, will leave it there. So you've got, you've got this reoccurring opportunities. You know, unlike, for example, a billboard ad, which after the campaign's finished, the ad's stripped down um what's good about what's good about um you know evergreen content that's the word i was trying to think of yeah uh, you know we're, we're still seeing videos way past the campaign finish and therefore they're still getting you know um found feedback it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. long tail right long tail yeah, yeah. exactly so we, we we definitely have uh things that we need to consider especially when we're going to ask for that funding internally, we need to be reminding the person who's opening the purse strings that this is part of what we get. Uh, yeah. Do you also think that there are limits to the numbers? You mentioned there that there's the rise of private communities and dark posts, things that are not necessarily trackable um, unless the influencer is willing to pop open their own account and show the brand uh, what they have. Are, are there things that we need to think about there? Well, actually, uh, memberships. So a lot of uh, influencers have got their own membership groups. Okay. Like this and, would be and, like and, Patreon or something. They, like that. Exactly, okay. exactly. So we don't have access. Many, many of the influencer agencies and platforms don't have access to that because it's closed communities. So you are, you are very much reliant on what the influencer is telling you um, to give you some, some deeper insights. But then you could argue the quality of people that were in the paid community could be a better consumer for you. Sure. Yeah, they're ardent fans, aren't they? They are indeed. Yeah. And uh, I think the numbers have shown that, you know, their purchases are you know, far higher and far faster, at least if I think of what my kids tell me with when <laughs> someone comes out with, as the kids call it, a merch drop uh, that, you know, things quantities that are unimaginable, like complete ocean containers where the yeah. product are getting sold in minutes. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. No, indeed. Indeed. Any final thoughts for us, Gordon, on how we should be approaching influencer marketing as part of our overall marketing effort? Um, I tell you what you can do is you can start to follow your top clients on LinkedIn and you can start to um, engage with their comments and what they're putting out so um this is really important because you are recognizing your clients your your what's important to, to your clients is when they post something um so help them help them and and acknowledge recognize engage create conversation because also there may well be other people within the organization that are seeing your your point of view that could help you develop be deeper better relationships also, some other clients that are following your target customer or existing customer could also be seeing those comments. So this is a really, really great way to build your influence um, and, and to do that. Yeah, that's an excellent actually note to end on because it takes us all the way back to the beginning where we talk about the uh, 
the point of view. And the, there was something that you brought up at the very beginning of the book that I don't want to leave without mentioning is you helped me to see that what social networks have brought us by connecting all of us is they have, you, you compared them to the railways and you said, you know, that the uh, old types of, you know, if we think about how railways democratized the ability to get goods from A to B and in many, many different directions. But of course the railways are just, they're, they're just ties and, you know, just, it's a ribbon of steel just laying there on the ground. You need to have some conveyance. And I think you, you know, by that analogy, you would call the influencers, the trains that travel along those tracks. That's and, exactly. Right. That's exactly. And I, I, when I think of that, I think, okay, well, if my brand, if my brand simply wants to be everything to everyone, then I'm kind of like a product that just doesn't have any destination. I'm Correct. Not, I'm not going anywhere, so to speak. However, if I do have a point of view, a brand value, or as maybe Joe Polizzi would call it a content tilt, uh, and I find a influencer that is going in that same direction, then we can travel together, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And that's, that's one of the reasons why the industry uses the word collab, collaboration, brand and influencer collaborating together to to increase engagement for the brand follow a follow a increase for the influencer and everybody happy i mean that's the fundamental of what everybody wants out of this you know we want a happy audience we are happy influencer and a happy brand <laughs> win 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 uh where, where can people find out about the book and about what you do um, that's very nice for you to say. Um, so I've got my own website, which is simply gordonglenister.com. Uh, lots of, I host a weekly round table um, on a Wednesday morning um, on Zoom. I also have a Facebook group as well, um, which anybody can happily join. Um, it's called Influencer Marketing Secrets. And in terms of the book, you can buy the book uh, on Amazon, on any other leading bookstores. It's out in America. Um, uh, from last March and so do, doing very well. So uh, yeah, thank you so much for giving me the time to talk to you. And I'm very glad that you joined us. And to the listener, I'm really glad that you got a chance to hear from Gordon on this important field that is going to be an even larger part of marketing going forward. And I hope that you share this episode with someone who could benefit from it and that you got something out of it that helps you make your funnel and your lead generation efforts even better. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.